Thanks for joining us. Um, we're just going to take another minute or two to let people continue to trickle in. Um, if you don't mind dropping a note in the chat box to let us know that you can hear us okay, that would be great. We'll be back in just a minute. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, welcome to On Life Health webinar series presented in conjunction with Health Trust Slice of Life program. We're your hosts, Olivia Rowe and Ashley Benningfield. Olivia is from a small town in Pennsylvania, just outside Williamsport, the home of the Little League World Series. She graduated from Ithaca College in 2013 with a degree in television and radio communications and a concentration in screenwriting. She's previously worked as a writing assistant in LA and was an editor of a local newspaper in Pennsylvania. Prior to joining On Life in January, she worked at Pop Culture Media, which is an entertainment news website under CBS Interactive. Olivia currently serves as the manager of content and digital media. She loves going hiking, listening to podcasts, and spends much of her free time writing fiction and watching documentaries. She considers herself a news junkie who's obsessed with pop culture trivia. So Ashley is originally from Germantown, Tennessee, right outside of Memphis. She graduated from UT Knoxville in 2004 with a bachelor's degree in dietetics. From there, she went on to complete her dietetic internship at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Ashley is a registered dietitian technician and has been at On Life for almost 15 years. Throughout her tenure here, she's held several positions ranging from a health coach to a marketing content writer and now she currently serves as our content and digital media specialist. A few fun facts about Ashley, On Life Health is the only place she's ever worked. She loves cleaning and organizing, working out, and spending time with her husband and seven-year-old son. She's also a huge Jason Aldean fan. So for those of you that have joined us before, welcome back. And for those of you who may not have had the chance to join us, welcome. We look forward to interacting with everyone today. So today we'll be breaking down our topic, pre-diabetes and diabetes, what's the difference? Before we start, just a couple of notes about the webinar. It's being recorded in a listen-only mode. So in other words, you'll be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. And the last 10 to 15 minutes of this webinar have been set aside for questions and answers. And even though we can't hear you, at any point during the webinar, you can type your questions in the questions box at the bottom of your control panel. I'll try to keep my eye on it throughout the webinar. We'll attempt to answer as many of the questions at the end as possible during the Q&A portion. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so we wanted to start by asking you a question. Do you know the difference between prediabetes and diabetes? And what is it? Go ahead and type your answers in the questions box if you have an idea.
couple of you have said no. I don't know if I can hear you say yes. Some it has something to do with sugar levels. No idea, yes. I don't know the difference. Okay, well, we're gonna um, talk about that today, so it's perfect. So today, you will learn the difference between prediabetes and diabetes, as well as what your risk factors are. You'll also learn what you can do to lower your risk of developing diabetes while becoming a healthier person in the process. And then, as always, we'll end today's session with Q&A. So before we dive in, let's take a couple minutes to look at some numbers as they relate to diabetes. So according to the Center for Disease Control, more than 30 million adults in the U.S. have diabetes, but one in four don't even know they have it. And more than 84 million U.S. adults have prediabetes, and 90% of them don't know they have it. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S., and it's the number one cause of kidney failure, lower limb amputations, and adult blindness. Later in the presentation, we'll get into these complications more in depth. In the last 20 years alone, the number of adults that have been diagnosed with diabetes has more than doubled as the population has aged and become more overweight. Medical costs and lost work and wages for people with diagnosed diabetes total $327 billion yearly, and medical costs for people with diabetes are twice as high for those who don't have it. In the next slide, we'll discuss the basics of diabetes. It's worth pointing out that this presentation will mainly focus on prediabetes and the type of diabetes that often follows it, type two. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a chronic or long-term health condition that's marked by elevated blood sugar levels. Diabetes is the result of your body being unable to produce and or use insulin properly, and it affects how your body turns food into energy. So to better understand diabetes, it's important to know how the body uses the food that we eat for energy. This is a process called metabolism. So let's talk a little bit more about this in detail. So most of the food that you eat turns into sugar, which your body, the cells in your body, they use this every day for energy. But the sugar can't get into the cells by itself. Normally, the pancreas releases a hormone called insulin into the bloodstream. This serves as the key that lets the sugar into the body's cells to use as energy. When sugar leaves the bloodstream and enters the cells, the blood sugar level is lowered. But when your body can't use insulin the right way, the sugar doesn't move into the cells. Instead, it stays, stays in your bloodstream and causes blood sugar levels to rise. This is known as hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. And over time, this can lead to serious health problems such as heart disease, vision loss, and kidney disease. There is no cure for diabetes, but there are things that you can do to become a healthier person in the process. Things like losing weight, eating healthy food, and being active can really help. And also, if needed, taking medication. You can also get diabetes self-management education and support, and keeping your healthcare appointments can also reduce the impact of diabetes on your life. And as Olivia alluded to, we'll touch on some of these things throughout the presentation today. Okay, so prediabetes. Prediabetes comes before type 2. It's a warning sign that you're at risk for getting type 2 diabetes. It means that your blood sugar is higher than it should be, but it's not high enough to be considered diabetes. Most people who get type 2 have prediabetes first. You may also hear prediabetes referred to as impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose. So what causes prediabetes? So as we just mentioned, when you eat food, it turns into sugar, which your body uses for energy. And normally the pancreas makes insulin, which allows the sugar in the blood to get into the body cells. But when your body can't use insulin the right way, the sugar doesn't move into the cells and instead stays in the blood. And this is called insulin resistance. It's the buildup of the sugar that causes prediabetes. And if your blood sugar stays too high, for too long, prediabetes can turn into type two. People who are overweight, sedentary, and have a family history of diabetes are at greater risk for developing prediabetes. 
And like we said, while today's presentation is focused on prediabetes and type 2, we did want to just briefly touch on type 1 and compare that to type 2. So type 1 diabetes only accounts for about 5% of people with diabetes. It's thought to be caused by an autoimmune reaction that causes your body to stop making insulin. Type 1 diabetic symptoms often develop fast and it's typically diagnosed in children, teens, and young adults, but it can happen at any age. At this time, type 1 diabetes has no cure or prevention, and those with the illness must take insulin every day. With type 2 diabetes, your body doesn't use insulin well, and it can't keep blood sugar at a normal level. And about 90% of people with diabetes have this type. It develops over many years and is often diagnosed in adults, but more and more children, teens, and young adults are being diagnosed. In fact, type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, but that name had to be changed as more and more young people are diagnosed. With type 2 diabetes, you might not notice any symptoms, so it's important to get your blood sugar tested if you're at risk. Type 2 diabetes may be prevented or delayed with healthy lifestyle changes, like losing weight, eating healthy, and being active. Okay, so let's get into symptoms. There are a bunch of them. Common symptoms of diabetes include increased thirst and hunger, frequent urination, fatigue, dry mouth, and blurred vision. You may also experience unexplained weight loss, numbness or tingling in feet or hands, dry and itchy skin, and sores that don't heal. Unlike symptoms of type 1 that often start very quickly in a matter of weeks, Type 2 symptoms of diabetes come on slowly, often over the course of several years. Symptoms can be so mild that you might not even notice them or even have any symptoms at all. Some people don't realize they have the disease until they have diabetes related health problems like health trouble, or sorry, like heart trouble. So how do you know if you're at risk? Well, type 2 diabetes is caused by several factors, including lifestyle factors and genetics. There are several risk factors that can increase your chance of getting prediabetes and type 2. So let's take a look at those briefly. Being overweight. Having extra weight can sometimes cause insulin resistance, and it's common in those with type 2 diabetes. The location of the body fat around, also, around your body also makes a difference. Having an unhealthy diet is another factor. Eating lots of high fat, high sugar foods, and not eating a balanced diet can make you more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. Not exercising or having a lack of physical activity. Having a family history where you have a parent, a brother, or sister who has type, type, type 2 diabetes, you're at a greater risk of getting it. The risk for getting prediabetes and type 2 diabetes increases with your age, but as we just said, the number of children with type 2 diabetes is uh, increasing. And usually children who get type 2 diabetes have a family history of the disease. They're overweight and they aren't physically active. Your race and ethnicity, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders are at higher risk than Caucasians for getting type 2 diabetes. And having a history of gestational diabetes, which is diabetes when you're pregnant. So women who have had this are at higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes later in life. A few other health problems that can put you at risk for developing uh, diabetes, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, having a history of heart disease, high blood pressure, having low HDL levels, which is the good cholesterol, and having a high triglyceride level. And you can prevent or delay type 2 diabetes with simple proven lifestyle changes, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so let's move on to diagnosis. Blood sugar levels are measured in milligrams per deciliter. And diabetes testing is simple, and the results are generally available quickly. In order to be diagnosed with diabetes, your doctor will perform one or more of the following blood tests to confirm the diagnosis. A hemoglobin A1C test measures your average blood sugar level over the past two to three months. An A1C below 5.7% is normal. And if your A1C is 6.5% or higher, you probably have diabetes. A fasting blood glucose test measures your blood sugar after you've had an overnight fast. A fasting blood sugar of 99 milligrams per deciliter or lower is normal. 
100 to 125 indicates you could have pre-diabetes, while 126 or higher suggests you have diabetes. And then there's an oral glucose tolerance test, and this measures your blood sugar before and after you drink a sugary liquid. You will fast overnight before the test and have your blood drawn to determine your fasting blood sugar level. Then you'll drink the liquid and have your blood sugar level checked one hour, two hours, and potentially three hours after. Then there's a random blood sugar test that measures your blood sugar at the time you're tested. You can take this test at any time and you don't need to fast. A blood sugar level of 200 or higher indicates you have diabetes. So the best way to manage prediabetes and prevent type 2 diabetes is, of course, getting your blood sugar levels back down to a normal range. So there are a few different ways you can do this, and lifestyle prevention is the number one recommended method for controlling blood sugar levels and for preventing or delaying diabetes. This includes maintaining a healthy weight, making healthy food choices, getting regular exercise, and taking medication if needed. Making these changes can help you avoid or delay some of the more serious problems that often come with diabetes, like heart attack, stroke, and heart, eye, nerve, and kidney disease. So let's look at a little bit more about these in detail. So diabetes and your weight, as we mentioned, one of the key components of a healthy lifestyle when you have diabetes is losing weight, if necessary, or maintaining a healthy weight. Many people who are newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are overweight. Extra weight, particularly around your waist, makes it harder for cells to respond to insulin. What you choose to eat, when you eat, and how much you eat are important to keeping your blood sugar level in the recommended range. If you're overweight, decreasing your weight by just 10% may be able to reverse your diabetes, put it into remission, or put off developing it at all. By losing weight, those with type 2 can improve their glucose intolerance, which is key to using insulin better. If you feel you might need help in managing your weight, try working with a registered dietitian who specializes in diabetes. They will help you set achievable goals and develop an eating plan that's right for you. Remember that weight loss is a temporary process. The real challenge is keeping off the lost weight. Permanently embracing a new way of eating is important. So next, um, we're going to talk about diabetes in your diet. So this is another component to managing your type 2 diabetes. And eating, when it comes to eating with diabetes, it's not about denying, depriving, or skipping the foods that you like. Rather, it's about making smart food choices because the food you eat plays a big role in balancing your blood sugar levels. So by understanding how certain foods affect your blood sugar, you can control the outcome and make sure you feel your best. So what can you eat? Everyone responds differently to different types of foods and diets, so there is no magic diet for diabetes. You have to find what works best for you. So here are some few, uh, few guidelines to get you started. First, limit the unhealthy fats like saturated fat and trans fats. Instead, choose foods with heart-healthy fats like canola and olive oil, nuts and seeds, avocado, and fish like salmon, tuna, and mackerel. Next, reduce the calories by limiting fried foods, foods high in salt or sodium, and beverages with added sugars like juice and soda. And then limit sweets, baked goods, candy, and ice cream. Now we're gonna talk about diabetes and carbohydrates. So the main purpose of carbs in your diet is to provide energy as your body's main fuel source. Carbs affect your blood sugar level more than any other food, so knowing how much and what type of carbs to put in your diet is important for managing diabetes. So there are three main types of carbs in food, starches, sugar, and fiber. And when you see the term total carbohydrate on a nutrition label, that refers to all three of these types. So starches, otherwise known as complex carbs, include starchy veggies like peas, corn and potatoes, dry beans, lentils and peas, and also grains like oats and rice. Sugar includes those that occur naturally in milk and fruit, and then those added during food processing. On the nutrition facts label, the number of grams of sugar includes both added and natural sugars. Refined carbs 
also known as simple carbs, are things like white bread and sugar sweetened drinks that cause spikes in blood sugar. And then the third type of carb is fiber. And this comes from a lot of plant-based foods like beans and legumes, such as black beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, and lentils. Fruits and veggies, especially those with edible skin like apples and beans. Nuts, so peanuts, almonds, and walnuts are good sources of fiber and healthy fat. And then also whole grains like whole wheat pasta and whole grain cereals. So you may need to adjust what you eat and how much you eat in order to better maintain your blood sugar. And again, working with a registered dietitian or certified diabetes educator is an excellent way to develop a diabetes meal plan. And they can work with you to learn how to count carbs, understand and use portion sizes to reduce your intake and limit your caloric intake. And these are all important steps when living with type two diabetes. Another important part of managing type two diabetes is regular physical activity. So exercise is beneficial for everyone, but it's especially important for people with diabetes. And that's because exercise promotes losing weight, which therefore improves insulin sensitivity and lowers your blood sugar levels. So the more active you are, the more sugar your body can use for energy. This prevents the glucose from building up in your blood. And exercise can also help you control your blood pressure and your cholesterol levels. But because exercise can cause a change in your blood sugar, it's important to plan ahead. Low blood sugar, also known as hypoglycemia, can occur if you take certain diabetes medication or after a long, intense workout. It can also happen if you've skipped a meal before exercising. So it's important to talk to your doctor as they may suggest that you take less insulin or that you eat a small snack with carbs before, during, or after exercise. You may also need to check your blood sugar level before, during, and after physical activity. So how can you fit in exercise? The easiest thing to do is find something that you love and do it as often as you can. But no matter how fit you are, a little activity every day can help you fight diabetes. You can do moderate activity, vigorous activity, or both. And it's important to note that you don't have to exercise in large increments. You can be active in blocks of like 10 minutes a day throughout your week, and you can gradually increase the amount that you do every day. Taking short exercise breaks like walking during the workday can be a great way to break it up. If you're interested in doing more moderate or vigorous activity, it's a good idea to talk to your doctor. Even though it's safe for most people, your doctor may <clears throat> check your heart and feet to make sure that there are no problems. And if you have high blood pressure, eye or foot problems, there are certain exercises that you might need to avoid. And if your doctor approves, you might want to include some muscle strengthening exercises at least twice a week. Things like push-ups, weight training, these may include using the rubber bands or the stretch bands, as using these tools can help you build muscle strength for major muscle groups like legs, hips, back, chest, and shoulders. And also joining a walking group or walking program is also another way to start exercising and stay motivated. So if you feel intimidated by starting an exercise program, just consult with your doctor about creating one that's right for you. We're gonna move on now to um, diabetes treatment. So when it comes to the medication you might take for diabetes, the medicine will vary by your type and how well the medicine controlled your blood sugar. And there are other things that may also factor into what kind of medicine you take, such as other health conditions, medication costs, and your daily schedule. What type one diabetes, you have to take insulin as your body no longer makes it. You may need to take it multiple times during the, during the day, including with meals. And you can also use an insulin pump, which gives you small doses throughout the day. And there are some people with type 2 diabetes that are able to manage it with healthy food choices and exercise. But many need diabetes medicine too. This may include oral medications, or if you have trouble controlling your blood sugar levels with dietary changes, exercise, and medication, then your doctor may also suggest insulin. Some may even have to take more than one medicine to control their blood sugar. And there are several types of diabetes medications used to treat type 2. And all work better, all work, sorry, to better control your blood sugar levels. 
Your doctor will explain your medication options and make the best recommendations for you based on your individual needs. So if you don't work hard to manage your blood sugar level, there are short and long-term complications to contend with. Diabetes increases your risk for many serious health problems, but the good news is that with the correct treatment and recommended lifestyle changes, many people with diabetes are able to prevent or delay the onset of these complications. So let's start by looking at the short-term complications first. The first one is hypoglycemia. And when you have diabetes, you may take insulin or other medications that lower your blood sugar, but you don't want your blood sugar to drop too low. So when your blood sugar drops to less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, you will likely experience symptoms of low blood sugar, otherwise known as hypoglycemia. And when this happens, your body will show signs that you need food. Some of these symptoms may include feeling weak, dizzy, having numbness in the mouth or tongue, trembling and shakiness, sweating, a fast heartbeat, confusion, and even loss of consciousness. Hypo, I'm sorry, hypoglycemia can be caused by eating meals late or skipping them, not getting enough carbohydrates, or being more active than usual, and even taking more medication than you need. It can even be caused by drinking alcohol without eating. So mild cases of hypoglycemia can be treated by drinking orange juice or eating a glucose tablet. These will raise your blood sugar level quickly. You should check your blood sugar again in 15 minutes and treat it every 15 minutes if levels are still low. Because if hypoglycemia is not treated, you may pass out. And if you have type 2 diabetes and you take insulin, you should always carry glucagon with you should you become unresponsive or unconscious because of hypoglycemia. You will need a quick injection of glucagon, which is a hormone that starts a process in your body that raises your blood sugar level. So another short-term complication is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. So that's a mouthful, but it is very rare and you should be aware of it and know how to handle it if it occurs. HHNS is when your blood sugar level goes way too high and if you don't treat it, it can be fatal. It's most likely to occur when you're sick and elderly people are most likely to develop it. It starts when your blood sugar level starts to climb. And when that happens, your body will try to get rid of all the excess sugar through frequent urination. And that dehydrates your body and you'll become very thirsty. Unfortunately, when you're sick, you can't always rehydrate your body as you should. You might have trouble keeping fluids down, for example. When you don't rehydrate your body, the blood sugar level continues to climb and it can eventually go so high that it will send you into a coma. To avoid HHNS, you should especially keep close watch on your blood sugar level when you're sick. Talk to your healthcare professional about having a sick day plan to follow. So moving on to the long-term complications of type 2 diabetes. These complications develop over many years and over time, high blood sugar can damage the body's blood vessels, both tiny and large. So damage to your tiny blood vessels causes microvascular complications while damage to your large vessels causes macrovascular complications. And some of these long-term complications include diabetic retinopathy, kidney disease or nephropathy, diabetic neuropathy, and other macrovascular problems. And we're gonna talk about some of these right now. So first, uh, some of the microvascular complications. Um, you have small blood vessels that can be damaged by consistently high blood sugar. Damaged blood vessels don't deliver blood as well as they should. And that leads to other problems specifically with the eyes, kidneys, and nerves. So specific to the eyes, um, blood sugars out of range for a long period of time can cause cataracts and or retinopathy in the eyes. Both can cause loss of vision. So to avoid your eye problems associated with diabetes, of course, keeping your blood sugar under control, but also have a yearly eye checkup that includes a dilated eye exam with an eye doctor to monitor your health, your eye health. Next is kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy. And this leads to impaired kidney function, dialysis and or a kidney transplant. Uncontrolled diabetes can cause the kidneys to fail and then they'll be unable to clean the blood properly. 
When the kidneys begin to have problems, they start to release too much protein. To prevent diabetic nephropathy, you should have your albumin levels tested every year to check for a condition known as microalbuminuria. This is an early sign of kidney problems. The test is simple. It measures how much protein is in your urine and it's easily done with a urine sample. And medications can help prevent further damage once it's diagnosed. So moving on to your nerves. Nerve damage caused by diabetes is also known as diabetic neuropathy. These, the tiny blood vessels feed your nerves. So if the blood vessels are damaged, then those nerves will eventually be damaged as well. In type two diabetes, some people will already show signs of nerve, nerve damage when they're diagnosed. And this is an instance where getting the blood sugar level under control can prevent further damage to your nerves. There are various forms of this, the most common being a peripheral neuropathy. And this most often affects the nerves going to the hands and the feet. Most people who have had type two for a very long time and who haven't done well managing their blood sugar may lose sensation in their feet. They may also experience pain, weakness, or tingling. One serious complication of diabetic peripheral neuropathy in the feet is that people may not realize when they have a sore on their foot. That sore can become infected, the infection can spread, and left untreated, the foot may need to be amputated to keep the infection from spreading more. This is why it's important to have regular foot exams done by a podiatrist. And you should also have your healthcare provider examine your feet every time you have an office visit. Now next, let's look at the ma macrovascular complications of type two, which affect the large blood vessels, the heart, brain, and blood vessels, causing plaque to build up and potentially lead to a heart attack, stroke, or vessel blockage in the legs, which is known as peripheral vascular disease. To prevent heart disease and stroke as a result of diabetes, you should manage your diabetes well, but also make heart healthy choices in other areas of your life. So don't smoke, keep your blood pressure under control and pay attention to your cholesterol. It's important to have your cholesterol checked annually and your doctor should check your blood pressure at every office visit. And also at every office visit, your doctor should check the pulse in your feet to make sure that there's proper circulation. Diabetes can lead to problems in your mouth, such as infection, gum disease, or dry mouth. To help keep your mouth healthy, manage your blood sugar, obviously, and then also brush your teeth twice a day, see your dentist at least once a year, and don't smoke. And while type 2 diabetes comes with certain short and long-term complications, if you manage good blood sugar, if you manage your blood sugar well, you can avoid them. So when it comes to managing your diabetes, practicing self-care is incredibly important. It allows you to assume responsibility and manage your disease. So self-care as a whole can include many things, but as it relates to diabetes, it includes things that we've talked about throughout the whole presentation. Eating well, maintaining a healthy weight, staying active, practicing proper foot care, managing your blood sugar, quitting smoking, and maintaining healthy levels of cholesterol, blood pressure, and of course your blood sugar. And as far as quitting smoking, the reason it's important to quit smoking other than for your overall health is that smoking raises your blood sugar, cholesterol, and your blood pressure, all of which people with diabetes need to be especially concerned about. When you have diabetes and use tobacco, the risk of heart and blood vessel problems is even greater. So if you quit smoking, you will lower your risk for heart attack, stroke, nerve disease, kidney disease, and oral disease. And maintaining healthy cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels because when cholesterol is too high, the insides of your large blood vessels become narrowed and they can even become clogged, which can lead to heart disease and stroke, the biggest health problems for people with diabetes. And maintaining normal cholesterol levels will help prevent these diseases and can help prevent circulation problems. About 60% of adults with diabetes have high blood pressure or use prescription medications to reduce high blood pressure. Maintaining a normal blood pressure helps to prevent damage to the eyes kidneys, heart, and blood vessels. So now that we've touched on many aspects of both prediabetes and diabetes, we did want to provide you with some further resources so that you can check them out for more information.
We really just skimmed the surface here today. So if you're looking for more specific information related to this topic, please talk to your doctor and consider diving into these resources. And if you're newly diagnosed, check out books from your local library on diabetes. You can reach out to a registered dietitian or certified diabetes educator, or ask your doctor about local offerings through local clinics and hospitals. So this list that we provided here, um, we've made available in a handout, um, and that is should be accessible in your control panel. Um, there should be like a spot where you can download it. Um, but if you aren't able to find that spot or you can't download it for whatever reason, um, you can feel free to email me, Olivia. My name, my email address is on the follow-up email you'll be receiving, and it also should have been on the reminder emails that you got. Um, so feel free to email me for this um, handout, and also if you have any follow-up questions about anything. Um, and we know this was a lot of information today, um, so if you have any questions, we wanted to open this time up to talk about them. And we'd love to hear um, if you wanted to share anything new that you learned, um, something that was surprising to you. Um, but if you have any questions about all this information, um, feel free to leave a comment in the box um, and we will look through them right now. Um. Um, someone asked the range of glucose level that would induce a person to go into a coma. Um, I'm actually not sure. I know that we can find that out for you from, we actually have clinical specialists here, so we can reach out to them just to get that correct number for you and provide that information in a follow-up email. Yeah, um, this person's name is Michael. If you don't mind sending me an email, um, just so I have your address so we can respond to this question for you, um, we can get that the number that you're looking for about what range glucose level will induce a person to go into a coma. We can answer that for you. So fungal issues, not that I am aware. We haven't come across it's, anything about total fungal issues for diabetics. The problem with the, the feet is that when um, you won't be, like if the sore, if it gets sore, you won't be able to feel it if your blood sugar gets too high and then you're at risk for infection and then it could eventually you know the amputation so as far as toe fungal issues yeah it has to do more with the losing sensation. yeah losing sensation in your feet and then not being able to tell if you have a sore because you've lost sensation so that's why it's important um to ask your doctor to check your feet when you go um and to see a podiatrist as well um Um, I have low blood sugar issues at times, but I've never been diagnosed with prediabetes. No, not mm -mm. no. Um, high high blood sugar is associated with um, prediabetes, not low blood sugar. What do you do to get that under control at time when it does occur? Can you tell us that? Um, is testing for your glucose. I know here we get, you can fast and they do check your blood sugar level, um, as part of our, a lot of times if you get like basic blood work done, it usually includes like a glucose, like a, a, a glucose reading and they'll often have you fast. So if that number is higher then you would want to get it tested again. Um, but as far as like if you're just having a like a physical, it's it's not going to be part of that. It, you would have to get your your blood um, checked. Um, but if you're concerned about this, you should definitely feel free to ask your doctor um, to get a test done. Or they can a lot of them will suggest, oh, um, you know, you haven't had blood work done in X amount of time. Maybe we should check it. Um,
going through some of these questions now, if we don't get to them again, feel free to email us. Um, some of these questions, I'm not, we're not going to know the answers off the top of our head, um, but we will get you the answers. Um, as Ashley said, we have clinical specialists here who can help us. Um, someone asked, Mark asked, are natural non-sugar sweeteners such as stevia beneficial substitutes? Yeah, so there's obviously some research out on um, the effect of artificial sweeteners. Um, so I would, I, I don't believe it affects diabetes, but I would talk to your doctor about kind of maybe the levels that you should watch with um, artificial sweeteners. But as far as substituting for sugar, um, yes. How often should blood sugar be tested for A1C? It's every two to three. Oh, how often should it be tested? All right, working on the answer on that for you. So, um, if you have prediabetes, it's recommended once a year, and if you have diabetes, it's twice a year. But of course, always ask your doctor. So do you want to go back to this slide then? Um, someone, another person is asking about A1C, so we're just going to go back to the slide about the tests. So she's asking for pre-diabetes. Yeah. Yes, it is used to test for pre-diabetes. So if, can you, if you see in the picture, It's the, the orange one. It is 5.7 to 6.4% indicates prediabetes. If you see here on the slide, um, this orange one that indicates prediabetes. Um, so it's a, it's, a heme, it's a hemoglobin test and it measures your average blood sugar over the last um, two to three months. It is mainly a test for prediabetes, yes. So going through the questions here. Are there any other questions, um, questions about food, questions about anything that we talked about? Um, like I said, I know this was a lot of information and it's very um, clinical related. Um, and if we didn't answer your question, as I said, feel free to give me, send me an email and we'll make sure that we get it answered for you. Okay, I'm not seeing um, any other questions that we're able to answer right now. Um, so we hope that you are able to join us for our next webinar. And um, sorry, there's another question. Someone's asking about natural sweeteners such as honey and maple syrup. So honey and maple syrup, they are 
obviously like more they're more natural in the sense that they're not processed but it's still like the same it's still like sugar is sugar in that case um so it's still going to affect your blood sugar in the same way that like a processed sugar found in like a processed food is going to um so you still have to um manage those sugars as well um so our next webinar it will be in february and we hope that you'll be able to join us. Um, just to reiterate, once again, if you have any more questions, feel free to shoot me an email and you will receive um, a follow-up with the recording. Um, so you can refer back to this and um, check any more information out that you want as well. So we will talk to you next time and we thank you for joining us.